Let us continue to worship God in prayer. Father, as we come before your word, fill us with your spirit and enable us to fix our mind on Christ. And Lord, by the grace of your spirit, speak to the heart and mind of each one of us. Father, I am your servant. Use me as you please, so that Christ may be honored and glorified. In his name we pray. Amen. As I wrap up, the ministry here at Petty Church. I am grateful to God for so many of you. Today, I just want to express my gratitude for Pastor Tingson, who has been my mentor and friend in ministry, Minister Tina, Reverend Kolinko, Sister Donnie, Minister Najali, Sister Carol, and all the staff who have persevered with me through these turbulent times in our society. I also give thanks to God for our small group leaders, Brother Alan and Deacon Tunde for the men's group, Sister Christy Cusimo and Minister Tina for the women's group, Reverend Kolinko for the praise team and the choir, Brother Christian Newby and Minister Najeli for our youth group, and Brother C.J. Nupin for the InnoVarsity student group. I am also deeply grateful to God for the prayers, prayer warriors behind the scene. Brother Christopher Nuanko, Sister Valerie, Sister Lillian Nupin, Minister Tina, Minister Nojeli, and so many of you who have prayed for me and my family behind the scene. And for all of your prayers, I am deeply grateful. Thank you. Last Sunday, I introduced four principles for discerning God's calling. There are many more, but these four have been meaningful to me personally. First, we seek the will of God with complete openness to whatever He wills. Second, we need to focus on knowing Christ more deeply and becoming more like Him in our character because our character determines how we interpret His will. Third, we, we need to know what makes us joyful because joy is the strength that sustains us on the face of obstacles on the road. Fourth, we need to seek counsel from a multitude of wise counselors. So these will give us sufficient clarity to take the first step. But the call of God is open-ended. God reveals his plan one step at a time. He gives us just enough manna for today. So we follow what we know to be God's will. Then he will lead us to what we don't know. Now there's a kind of theology that says, if we follow God's calling, then all the doors will be opened for us. We will have success after success, and everything will fall into place. Next slide, please. But that's not reality. You know, I got this cartoon from the internet. The reality is that the road is full of ditches, valleys, and obstacles. And we will run into difficulties, setbacks, and disappointments. For some of us, it might, be, it might mean 
a rejection letter from school or a company. For some, it might mean the loss of career, loss of dream. For some, it might mean a loss of relationship, family members. Now, God does not guarantee that the road will be smooth, but he promises that he will be with us always. That's the promise that we need to hold on to. As we noted a few weeks ago, when Abram and Sarai arrived at the land of Canaan, God announced to them, to your offspring, I will give this land. But what was the first thing that they found out about the land? Well, there was a famine in the land. It was no ordinary famine. It was severe. The promised land did not appear to be the land flowing with milk and honey. It could not sustain life. But Abram had a family to support. So Abram and Sarai headed toward Egypt. We are not told what went through Abram's mind, but he must have wondered, am I rightly following God's calling? Have I heard the voice of God rightly? Have I been following God or my own desires? Is it God who led me here? Am I in the place where God wants me to be? So there will be times when we will be asking the same questions as we follow God's calling. Let me give another example. King David. David was only a young man when he was anointed by the prophet Samuel. He soon rose to prominence by defeating Goliath. But his success provoked jealousy from King Saul, who became obsessed about eliminating David. Saul made at least 12 attempts to kill David. He threw a spear at David. He lured David into a death trap. He sent a death squad to kill David. He and his army pursued David in the wilderness. And and David became a fugitive, running for life. And he spent much of his young adult years in the wilderness, among the Philistines. Some of the psalms that David composed are from his ears as a fugitive. For example, Psalm 56 was written when he was seized by the Philistines. David cries out, Be merciful to me, O God, for men hotly pursue me. All day long they press their attack. My slanders pursue me all day long. Many are attacking me in their pride. Psalm 57 was written when David fled Saul into a cave. I am in the midst of lions. I lie among ravenous beasts, men whose teeth are spears and arrows, whose tongues are sharp swords. These psalms are full of heart-wrenching cries. So why did David suffer so much if he was rightly following God's calling? That's because he was called by God. If he remained as a shepherd boy in the safety of his father's house, he would not have suffered so much. But he suffered because he was called by God. David, by no means, was unique 
all of the cloud of witnesses mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11 faced serious obstacles as they followed the Lord. Some of them faced lions. Some escaped the edge of the sword. Some were tortured to death. Some faced jeers and flogging. Some suffered imprisonment. All of them were mistreated or persecuted in some way. So what about us? What do we do when we run into obstacles on the way? Do we conclude that it must not be God's will, so we turn back? What do we do when we appear to be in the wrong place? What do we do when one morning we wake up and we think that we married the wrong person? What do we do when, when God seems silent? What do we do when our prayers are not answered in ways that we want them to be answered? Now, it is possible that we might be mistaken about the will of God or we might be following our own desires. So the first thing we need to do is to examine our own heart to see if there are any sins that hinder us from following God's will. Today's text, Hebrews 12.1 says that we need to throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. We are obviously hindered by our sin against God. That will clearly hinder our prayers. The prophet Isaiah says in Isaiah 59 verse 2, Your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. We are also hindered by our sin against our neighbor. For example, the Apostle Peter in 1 Peter 3, 7 says, Husbands, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. Of course, it applies not only to husbands, but also to wives. If wives don't treat their husbands with respect, then their prayers would be hindered. Our sin against our neighbors will hinder our prayers. Another reason we are hindered in our prayers is that we deceive ourselves. It's the sin of self-deception and self-justification. These are the most insidious sins because if we deceive ourselves and justify our own sins, then there would be no possibility of our repentance. So instead of repenting, we are quick to blame others we are quick to point out a tiny speck of dust in other people's eyes while carrying a huge log in our own eyes. As I mentioned last Sunday, that's why we, you need people who love you enough to point out the log in your eyes. You need people who are wise enough not to flatter you, but speak the truth in love. Plainly, most important of all, our prayers must be completely honest. Honest with ourselves and honest with God. One of the great prayers that can help us do that is Psalm 139, verse 23. Search me, O God, 
and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. So the first thing we need to do is to examine our own heart to see if there are any sins that hinder us from following God's will. Second, when we run into obstacles on the way or our prayers are not answered immediately, God might be telling us to wait on Him, to wait for His time. Again, from the life of Abram and Sarai, we learn the reality of waiting for God. When God called them, they had long passed the childbearing age. Abram was 75 years old and Sarai 65. We know with the benefit of hindsight that they had to wait 25 years for the promised child. But let's try to put ourselves in their situation. Abram is almost 100 years old and Sarai almost 90. But they don't even have one child. Humanly speaking, it's impossible to have a child at that age. They can feel their body withering down to dry bones. They can feel pain in every joint. They can feel their time running out. As far as Abram and Sarai can see, there is absolutely no sign that God's promise is true. I suspect that during those long years of waiting, Abram and Sarai wrestled with doubts. I suspect that many times they cried out to God, How long, O Lord? How long? How long will you hide your face from me? This is a cry of lament. The paradox of prayer is waiting. Sometimes God answers our prayer right away. Other times God makes us wait. Now, there are at least a few reasons why God postpones his answer to our prayers. One reason is that we don't know what the best time is. We see only what is immediately in front of us. We have no idea what's going on in the heavenly realms. But God knows the best time for us. The Kairos time his divinely appointed times. So he makes us wait for the Kairos time. Another reason that God makes us wait is for the growth of our character. We remain immature even after many years of attending church because we have not learned to wait for God. As we all know, little babies cannot wait. If they want something, they cry immediately, and that's okay for little babies. But our culture encourages us to remain infantile. It constantly brainwashes us with a message of instant gratification. Why wait? Why not now? If we don't get it now, we will never get it. Buy now and pay later. Satisfy your desires now and deal with the consequences later. And this has an effect on our practice of faith. We expect instant spiritual, spiritual growth, instant transformation of our heart and soul without the long discipline of daily quiet time with God. Instant growth into maturity without waiting on God. 
Even secular psychologists have found the importance of learning to wait. You've probably heard the term emotional intelligence. The psychologists have found that emotional intelligence is a much stronger predictor of our success in life than IQ. What's really interesting is that emotional intelligence is closely connected with our ability to delay gratification. That is our ability to wait for a greater fulfillment later rather than settling for something less right now. Delayed gratification is good for us. Waiting on God for a greater fulfillment later makes us mature. The Apostle Paul says in Romans 5.3 that suffering produces perseverance, meaning to remain under perseverance. And perseverance produces character. And character produces hope. A mature Christian is not produced overnight. But in the crucible of waiting on God, we might not understand exactly what God is doing behind the scene, but God uses the time of waiting to transform our character. Abram and Sarai waited 25 years for the promised child. And God used those years to make them our ancestors of faith. While we're waiting on God, God takes all of our weaknesses, all of our mixed motives, and burns them with the fire of the Holy Spirit until they're purified, refined, and sanctified. Waiting on God makes us mature. So when we run into obstacles on the way or our prayers are not answered immediately, there is a third possibility. It might be that God has a better plan. Far better than we can conceive in our mind. Hebrews 11.40 says, God had planned something better for us. So when our prayers are not answered the way we want it to be answered, or when things are not going the way we want them to go, it might be be that God has planned something better for us. This reminds me of the story of Joseph. As we know, Joseph... Joseph's life turned out to be completely different from what he had imagined. When he was only 17 years old, Joseph was almost killed by his own brothers. He was taken to Egypt and sold as a slave. In a matter of hours, Joseph's life was turned upside down. He fell from a pampered son into a slave. Because of the evil that his brothers committed against him, Joseph ended up spending 13 years as a slave and as a prisoner in Egypt. How can Joseph forget that terrifying moment when his brothers converged on him to kill him? How can he ever forget the loneliness of the night in the stench-filled dungeon? How can he ever forget the 13 years of shame, affliction, and subjugation? Joseph could have become a bitter man. But I believe that there is one thing that Joseph never forgot. He never forgot God's greatness and goodness, as we sang this morning. 
Of course, he had no idea how God's greatness and goodness would work out in his life. But when he recognized his brothers who came down to Egypt to buy grain from him, everything that had happened began to make sense in the light of God's greatness and goodness. And Joseph began to see the goodness of God's plan in everything that had happened. So Joseph is able to say to his brothers who tried to kill him and sold him as a slave. In Genesis 45, verse 5, Do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there has been famine in the land, and for the next five years, there will not be plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then, it was not you who sent me, but God. It's one of the most moving passages in the Bible. From the human perspective, it was his brothers who sent him into Egypt. But God had planned something far better far better than either Joseph or his brothers could have conceived. It was not you who sent me here, but God. As we go through this time of transition, it might feel like we're going through valleys and obstacles. But we need to trust in God's greatness and goodness. We need to trust that God has planned something better for Petty Church. In His goodness, God has planned something far better than we can conceive. And we see a small glimpse of what God has planned among the next generation. We see a glimpse of that among those who are thirsty for God. We see a glimpse of that among those who are growing in the likeness of Christ. We see a glimpse of that among those who are reaching out to the lost. God has planned something better for Petty Church. You are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, and you are called to be part of that great cloud of witnesses whose names are written in the book of life. So throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And run the race with perseverance. Do not give up just because you face obstacles on the road or because your prayers are not answered the way you want them to be answered. Persevere in running the race. Persevere in prayer. Wait on God. God has planned something better for you. So fix your eyes on Jesus Christ, the author and perfecter of your faith. Fix your eyes on Jesus Christ, who endured the cross for the joy set before him. Fix your eyes on Jesus Christ and persevere on the face of obstacles for the joy set before you. As I close this message, I would like to invite you to a moment of silent meditation. in the silence of your heart. Approach the throne of God's grace with complete openness, 
and ask him, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. Gracious Father, fill us with your spirit and strengthen us to fix our eyes on Jesus Christ and enable us to persevere on the face of obstacles for the joy set before us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.